Yeah, they say always begin a story in medias res, but this is like walking in the middle of a conversation and spinning your head wondering what the fuck are they talking about. Guess this is a good time to say that this is the best you fail screen I've ever seen. It's like a slap in the face for messing up on the challenge. Sounds like a decent variety, right? Well, there's one major problem that comes up later in the game. Crash bash. Crash fucking bash. What is there to say? Well, it certainly marked the end of the PS1 era for Crash. But not with a bang. More with a whimper. Basically, after four successful titles of Crash Bandicoot, Naughty Dog had a lot of reasons as to why they wanted to part ways with the series. They themselves were getting exhausted with the franchise and couldn't figure out new ways to innovate over it. Although, the general mistreatment from Universal Interactive Studios served as another factor. They did everything to piss Universal off with the last game, CTR, which included making the main villain an alien. Boy, that felt spectacularly. But at the end, Naughty Dog was like, Okay, goodbye. It's over. I'd left Crash Bandicoot with Universal, allowing them to lay their dirty hands on the orange marsupial. And thus, they made Crash Bash by tapping Uvercom Entertainment Software and Cerny Games. And this already kind of raises an eyebrow. I mean, Uvercom fell into bankruptcy in 2012. What adds to this is just how little there is regarding the development of Crash Bash. So either that's a sign this was rushed at the door for there to be another Crash game, or they were more secretive about this game's development. And this doesn't show more clearly than the reviews, which, while not too bad, were still nothing compared to what the previous four games had received. However, Andy Gavin does say that he doesn't like to talk about anything after Crash Bash, so I guess that ought to make Eurocom pat its back for something. Golf clap? Golf clap. But maybe I'm beginning this video with too much negativity. I mean, just look at Change.org. There are so many people that signed for this game to have a remake, so it certainly has its own fan base. And maybe on a more personal level, this was my first PS1 game, so maybe playing through this again I'll be able to relive the nostalgic moments. <laughs> They say there's never a dull moment, and Crash Bash takes that saying to heart with its opening. Sony Computer Entertainment America presents a Universal Interactive Studios production. Developed by Eurocom Entertainment Software. Crash Bash! Oh yeah, that intro, the build-up, the climax, it was also juicy... What am I looking at? Why is Crash having this uncanny smile pasted on his face? What have they done to him? Well, I have no obligation to play as Crash, even though this game's title is Crash Bash, so I guess I'll play as Embryo. All right, now the adventure mode begins. Uka Uka, how many times must you be told you cannot defeat me? I have heard enough of your shallow wisdom. It is I who is the strongest, and it is evil that will ultimately prevail. This bickering can go on no longer. We must resolve this once and for all time. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you two were arguing. I just wanted to play my game. So yeah, we've run into the first problem, which is the story. The biggest issue? As you can see, it starts in the middle of a scene that has supposedly already been happening, and we the viewer just happens to run into it. Yeah, they say always begin a story in medias res, but this is like walking in the middle of a conversation and spinning your head wondering what the fuck are they talking about? There is literally zero context behind what is going on. 
Maybe there could have been an extra scene to provide some background, but if I didn't know anything about Crash Bandicoot, I'd be totally lost. In fact, even as a fan of Crash, I'd, I'm still lost, because there is not the slightest clue of how these two got to where they were. So Aku Aku and Uka Uka are basically having an argument over who is the most powerful brother. They decide to grab several characters from the Crash cast and have them fight on their behalf. Why don't they just duke it out then and there? Oh, Uka Uka. The ancients would not allow it. There can be no malice between us. Okay, then. What's this? Yeah, it's a little bit of a weird scenario. It's like the writers at Eurocom slapped this together in order for there to be a framing device for the game without worrying about consistency. Random is probably the best word to describe it, since this feels so out of the blue. These two masks were just bickering one day and decided to make a competition out of it. And yes, of course a lot of people complain about you-know-who, but I also have to call this out. After the teams are set up, Aku Aku complains about Uka Uka having too many players, so Uka Uka allows him to choose. Get this! Aku Aku chooses none other than Dingo Dial and Tiny. Like, weren't Dingo Dial and Tiny basically like this? Crash! Coco! Store the pretty crystals! Tiny take them back! In Gladiator Arena! <laughs> I'd like to think that Embryo would potentially be a better candidate, just because Embryo had the audacity to help them in Crash 2, or bring back Tana or something. And of course, this guy. Here because what Crash Bash review would be complete without talking about him? I really have nothing else to add that hasn't already been said, but just... why? This here is basically a demonstration that Eurocom didn't know what they were doing with the source material. Who is this guy? The manual doesn't really give away too much, but I don't know what to say. He's just kind of here for this game and then never shows up again. Really shows how great of a character he was. Wow, only been what, one and a half minutes worth of this intro cutscene and there's like a gazillion problems. Like. I get this was supposed to be a simple story for a party game, but even if it only serves as a framing device, the story needs to make sense. Anything good I can say about the story? Well, I guess the premise is kind of interesting with the witch doctor masks dueling each other, and I guess it is kind of cool that the ending sequences changes depending on which side you choose to align with. Other than that, when dissected, the story generally falls apart and is quite laughably one of the worst attempts at a story thus far in the Crash franchise. Emphasis on thus far. If Naughty Dog had made this one and they wanted to piss off Universal, then this would have taken the cake. So after watching the intro cutscene, the game immediately transports you over to the warp room. So the whole premise of Crash Bash has you playing minigames to earn trophies, gems, or crystals, earning however many will allow you to access to a boss. The minigames all vary from throwing crates at one another in an arena, to playing pinball in a little... I don't know what these are... bumper car-like vehicles, to painting squares with a pogo stick. Sounds like a decent variety, right? Well, there's one problem that comes up later in the game. So the first set of minigames include Crash Ball, Pogo Painter, Jungle Bash, and Polar Push. They're standard for the most part. Crash Ball has you bouncing balls into other people's goals, decrease your opponent's score to zero, and you win. Other than the number of close calls, this is a solid minigame to start us off. Especially as a lot of heart-pounding moments to keep it interesting, especially when there are so many balls bouncing around the arena. Moving on. Polar Push. A minigame that has you trying to knock other characters off the ice while riding on a polar bear. Pretty simple and straightforward. Nothing much to add. Then you have Pogo Painter. Again, standard. It mainly has you hopping around on squares and breaking boxes to earn points. This is probably one of the more redundant ones. Nothing too exciting or pulse pounding, just hopping around and painting squares. Yay! Woohoo! But then after that, you have Jungle Bash which is probably the best of the four, 
You're placed in an arena and it tasks you with taking out the other opponents by tossing crates on one another. Definitely the least gimmicky of the other three minigame types, and one that feels the most related to Crash Bandicoot. After you earn four trophies, you fight a boss with Papu Papu. And it's not really much of a fight, he mostly has his Crash clones do all the work for him. Once in a while he'll flip the platforms underneath you, but for the most part it's kind of anticlimactic, especially when you defeat him. Or, he defeats himself. And it's all downhill from there! No, I'm serious. At this point you'll start to feel a sense of saminess with Crash Bash. I know there needs to be some kind of commonality in order for minigames to fall into categories, but at the same time, not much changes with the subsequent minigames other than there being a gimmick which either improves or dampens the experience. For instance, Space Bash has the explosive crates that destroy the floor beneath you. This adds a lot to the destructive nature of the Crate Crush gameplay since it forces you to strategize around using this aspect to your advantage. Sometimes you can leave your enemies stranded on opposite ends of the arena or knock them into the pit. Also, there are power-ups like the Aku Masks and the Z, which makes you move in slow motion. However, Tilt Panic doesn't really add to the Polar Push minigame type, at least if you're playing as Embryo. It's the same as Polar Panic except now the arena tilts depending on the weight exerted upon it. It kind of reveals the issue that some of the characters can be weak into Polar Push or Crate Crush minigames because Embryo has a push that barely budges his opponent and consumes his entire charge bar, he ends up being knocked around pretty easily and this gets especially noticeable when the floor is tilting and there are other characters that can push you off no sweat. In a similar vein, Poco Ogogo has you making squares in specific corners dependent on your color. Although the AI just moves about wherever they feel. It innovates over the painting squares concept by having you the player perform a different action other than breaking boxes to earn points. On the contrary, Beach Ball doesn't really change much from Crash Ball and is basically the same, minus the fact that you can now propel balls with a laser field. Then you have the new type of minigame, Desert Fox. And as cool as it sounds to move in a tank blowing up your enemies, this is anything but. The tank crawls at a snail's pace, which allows your opponent to surround you too easily to the point that it's easy to get trapped in tight spaces. Also, not to mention your bullets basically travel at the speed of a limp water buffalo dying from depression. What? And yes, it is at this point that the game requires you to collect the crystals and gems. Oh boy. This may not sound so bad, except some of these are just utterly excruciating to get. In the Crash Ball minigame, the Crystal Challenge basically takes away your ability to kick the balls into other people's goals. Doesn't sound too bad, right? Well, when there are several balls bouncing everywhere at once, you have to concentrate really hard. And I mean really hard, in order to prevent a ball from getting in. Or how about the gem challenge for Polar Panic? Top all of your enemies in 1 minute and 30 seconds. Easy peasy, right? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Embryo has a push that fills his entire charge meter. So, unlike Tiny and Coco, he can't push repeatedly, which leaves him at a distinct disadvantage to either getting pushed off if he misses or running out of time. You have to rely on the lightning strike with a 500 pound weight to win this one. Otherwise, it's near impossible. And you might be thinking, well, if he isn't strong in that field, just don't do it. Well, that's the thing. They require you to collect these crystals. Eventually, you'll have to do them. Like, you'd wonder, did they actually think a kid could pull this off? If it was just side post-game content, it would be understandable. But Lord Almighty, some of these were just unforgiving. Guess this is a good time to say that this is the best you fail screen I've ever seen. It's like a slap in the face for messing up on the challenge. 
This is especially effective in the Pogo minigames, where all the other characters ascend to the sky while you're facing the camera like a scolded student ready to be sent to detention. You fail. Oh dear, looks like I fucked up again. I guess maybe this is a good time to talk about the sound and graphics. The most part the OST is forgettable, but I do like it when they provide remixes of original songs from the series. As for the graphics, well, it's okay, but generally it's like they didn't even try. I don't know how else to describe it except standard, but not going beyond. It doesn't look particularly colorful like other Crash titles, and the background seemed barren with barely any detail. So yeah, take that for what you will. So eventually I collected enough crystals and gems to face off against the Bearminator, who is basically the mama bear from Crash 2. I must say that I do appreciate some of the tributes that Crash Bash tries to give to the other games. Papu Papu is kind of obvious, but the bear that chases you is more obscure, so I've gotta give Crash Bash some credit. Maybe Eurocom did some amount of research, even though they added... Ugh. So, on to the third warp room. With just more of the same. It's around this point that the AI starts to become more aggressive. Maybe not all the time, but a majority of the time, they will find ways to punish you, and this is not more evidence than in the Embolism minigame. The only way to have a fighting chance at winning this one is if you utilize the force fields that pop up on the sides of the arena. However, the worst part is just a sheer fact that these guys will just zip to them before you do. So throughout most of the minigame, I'm like a sitting duck flailing helplessly trying to repel balls from my goal. What makes matters worse is that Engine will frequently appear to unleash his flurry of balls, I'm not making a testicle joke, into the arena. Sometimes, the balls I kick away might ricochet off of Engine and go into my goal. Plus, he really does fire quite a few balls around to kill your score. Honestly, that's the only one of the bunch that I feel is actually worth mentioning. Everything else at this point kind of feels redundant since they're just kind of repeats. El Pogo Logo is the exact same minigame as Pogo Painter, other than the fact that Ripper Roo lays TNT crates everywhere. Snow Bash is just Jungle Bash, except you have slippery shoes, and there's a penguin that for whatever reason the AI feels the need to activate. Also, isn't it kind of ironic that this game's Crystal Challenge handicaps you with slippery shoes when you might as well have already had those? Let's see, I might be forgetting one. Oh, that's right, Melt Panic. Which is just the same as all the other Polar Push games, except now Uka Uka floats above you to affect you with ailments. It's like they were running out of ideas for some of these. And I guess Metal Fox is just Desert Fox with walls coming up. I mean, I do appreciate there was some effort to add a little gimmick to distinguish them from the others, but it's not enough. Despite certain changes and additions, the overall experience generally felt the same. Maybe they do introduce some new minigames like Dot Dash, and maybe I haven't played enough party games to understand if this is a similar case with Mario Party, but yeah, it was just samey and redundant and uh... <sighs> Well, surely the game must have some redeeming factors later on. Wait, what's this? Ten gems and seven crystals. But, but, I, I just, how what is this game trying to kill me? <laughs> So after going through all that crap, you fight the Komodo Bros and... Ho-hum boss fight. Blow up his machine. Then you fight the brothers themselves. What's nice is that there's a checkpoint if you die in the final stage. Alright. The last warp room. Let's fucking go! Skyballs. Nothing much to say other than identical to Crash Balls except the arena tilts back and forth, affecting your advantage relative to the other AI. Manic Panic. Honestly, I'll give this one some credit, because it at least did something a bit different compared to the other Polar Bush minigames. It added bombs. And let's face it, it sure was a hell of a lot of fun blowing your enemies off their bears. So this one actually has something going for it. Sadly, I couldn't say the same for... Bogo Padlock. I mean, 
The only original thing they came up with this one was that stepping on your own colored square and getting shot at by a missile cancels it out. Hence, there are these locked keys to prevent it from happening. Other than that, it's just the same. Ugh. Next, Drain Dash. Basically just Jungle Dash, except now you can arm yourself with weapons and fire at your enemies. Getting to gem in this one is quite honestly the hardest. Toxic Dash. Okay, with this one you really start to see the problems with the Dash minigames. The turning is so unwieldy to the point that it's very easy to run into the barrels on the side of the track. And this giant globulous monster just gets in the way of your sight, making it more difficult to navigate around a track, not to mention that enemies can kick you backwards, making this even more annoying. Jungle Fox. It's not any different from the other tank minigames, except now these totem poles will attack you. And finally, Ring Ding. Overall, I will say that I do appreciate how all the Medieval Mayhem minigames are different, and they all seem to have their own sense of style. It involves you jumping around, popping balloons of your color while in a clock tower. It's very simple and... similar to the other ones. I don't have much to say about it. I guess it's cool that you're doing it while spinning around on this clock of gear. Although, I have to question what is the relationship between balloons and Big Ben? And then, after going through more pain, you finally make it to fight the final boss. And guess what? It's Oxide! Like, it was just in the last game that we were racing against this guy, and now Eurocom figured, hey, let's do it again! Because he was such a popular character. And it's... oh Jesus. Alright, that's it. Cue the music! Fucking finally! So the ending will change depending on which character you chose. Hell, there's even a tiebreaker ending if you played this with two characters of different teams. But anyway, Uka Uka announces that the Earth is his and that this entire competition was a ruse in order for him to achieve world domination. Aku Aku, realizing too late he had been tricked, orders Crash and Coco to run, but Uka Uka had already grown too powerful. And then cut to happy credits with fireworks! And I could talk about the relic challenges and unlocking the rest of the minigames, but... Uh... And that was Crash Bash. Overall, yeah, definitely not worth your time.
As I've mentioned over and over, the gameplay suffers from immense repetition, mainly because the minigame concepts are so restricted and limited. Even with the little gimmicks here and there, most of them felt samey and didn't deviate too much from one another. The graphics, sound, presentation, none of these things particularly help it in a significant way. It's all just meh. In fact, that's a pretty good way to sum this game up. It was all just kinda meh. Well, I'm not sure if I want to leave the review on that rather awkward note. So, until next time. Well, it certainly marked the end of the PS1 era for Crash, but not with a bang, more with a whimper. So just... And that was Crash Bash. Overall, yeah, definitely not worth your time. As I've mentioned before, the gameplay suffers from immense repetition, mainly because the minigame concepts are so restricted and limited, even with the little gimmicks here and there. A lot of them... So Hi everyone, thanks for watching, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys later.